On this late edition of Nine News Tonight, U.S. troops are in Haiti on a peacekeeping mission instead of an invasion. O.J. didn't get the answer he wanted in court today. We have a real taste of fall coming our way later on this week. Highlights of the Lions and the Cowboys, and John Elway talks about what's wrong with the Broncos. Also, we'll hear from one of the Broncos' all-time great players about what he thinks the problems are. Nine News at 10, or Nine News After the Game, is next. Last summer, four... Focus on Colorado finds a system that works. Tomorrow on Nine News at 6. From Colorado's news leader, Ed Sardella, Adele Arakawa, meteorologist Mike Nelson, Paula Woodward, and Ron Zappolo Sports, this is Nine News. Good evening. I'm Adele Arakawa. And I'm Ed Sardella. Finally, no bloodshed in Haiti so far. There are about 3,000 U.S. troops in Haiti tonight, and they came ashore without a shot fired. And more will land tomorrow. Generally, some pretty good reaction for President Clinton for avoiding an invasion, even though he had to make a deal with Haiti's generals. The House of Representatives overwhelmingly approved a resolution this afternoon supporting the president and the troops. The Americans are getting a warm welcome so far. Haitians ran alongside the U.S. military vehicle shortly after they landed this morning. They're literally holding on to what they hope is the beginning of change, an end to their suffering. The U.S. troops went from invaders to peacekeepers because of the deal brokered by former President Carter yesterday. The Americans are popular among the tens of thousands of Haitians who don't support Haiti's military government. And the peacekeepers will stay until Haiti's elected president, Jean Bertrand Aristide, is back and Haiti is stabilized. That is something that still has to be worked out and something that subsequent actions by all the actors in the Haitian drama will have to be uh, heavily uh, relied upon. President Clinton says the deal that stopped the invasion is a good one. It calls for the three generals running the country now to step down by October 15th. But they don't have to leave Haiti. That was the one concession the U.S. had to make to complete the deal. The U.S. negotiators, former President Carter, retired General Colin Powell, and Senator Sam Nunn negotiated right up to the last minute. When they declared the deal done, U.S. planes were on the way to start the invasion. Launching of the first wave, in effect, while we were still trying to negotiate peace, uh, was a very disturbing thing to us and to them. And I said, okay, you have 30 more minutes, and then I will have to order you to leave because I was worried about their personal security. Their Powell expressed the relief of the nation. The image that we were all afraid we would see sometime this week has been avoided. And that image was of American youngsters killing Haitian youngsters, and Haitian youngsters killing American youngsters. But the man at the center of all of this, President Aristide, doesn't like the deal. Tonight, a top aide said Aristide has severe problems with the agreement. He is outraged at White House statements indicating he approved. The U.S. troops have moved into Haiti without a shot being fired, but they will be on constant alert because there are thousands of Haitians who support the generals and don't want the Americans there. Former President Carter is back in Georgia now, and he said tonight he's not happy with the Clinton administration's policy toward Haiti. He says he will keep in close contact with the generals because no one in the State Department and no one in the embassy in Haiti will communicate with them. Carter will be on Nightline tonight, and so will the other two negotiators, Powell and Nunn, starting at 12.20. Most Americans seem to like the way President Clinton is handling the Haiti situation. An ABC poll shows 55% of people surveyed say they approve. 37% disapprove, and 8% have no opinion. The telephone poll was taken last night. The margin of error is plus or minus 5%. The double murder charges will stand against O.J. Simpson. Today in court, attorneys for Simpson argued that the charges should be dismissed because of sloppy police work and dishonest detectives. Judge Lance Ito refused the request, saying police acted properly when they entered Simpson's estate without a warrant. The judge also says he believes there's enough evidence to order Simpson to stand trial. Jury selection begins next Monday. John Elway says there isn't a single thing that's wrong with the Broncos. It's a myriad of problems. He talked about the disaster against the Raiders on the Denver huddle tonight. Ron Zappolo hosted the huddle, and he is with us with more on Elway's comments. Sounds like uh, he counts himself among the myriad of problems. He always has, and uh, tonight was no exception. He feels he's certainly one of the problems, and the Broncos have even more problems. At 0-3, they play a week from tonight in Buffalo against the powerful Buffalo Bills. Now, tonight on the huddle, I asked John Elway, after a night of reflection, if he knew exactly what's wrong with the Broncos. 
You know, Ron, I think there's so many things wrong that you can't just put it on one thing. I think that uh, uh, what went on yesterday was an absolute joke. And I think that uh, a lot of times you go and look on film and say, you know, when you look at film, you never play as well as you're going to play, and you never play as bad as you think you can play. But it was just as bad on film as it was yesterday. So uh, there is a multitude of things that, uh, that is wrong with this team right now. And we fortunately have one extra day to try to get it figured out. But until we go out and start playing hard, I mean, you know, it's amazing that we could come out flat and, and uh, open the game like we did and, and then, uh, you know, never get back into the football game is amazing. It was amazing that it could come out flat against the Raiders. Coming up, Elway defends. The one man he says is not the problem is head coach. Well, he helped get rid of one coach, supposedly, so he can't very well be against this one. <laughs> I would have to agree with that. <laughs> okay, yeah. thanks. We'll talk to you later. Not since 1968 have the Broncos started out with such a bad record. Bronco fans aren't used to losing. Tom Costello reports plenty of them are looking for answers. Company, here they are, the top ten things overheard at yesterday's game. <laughs> Number nine. What do you mean this is not a scrimmage? Number seven. Tackle? I thought this was two-hand touch. I the feel to be 0-3. 0-3. Oh, oh, Imagine what it must have felt like to wear that embarrassing orange uniform yesterday. The only thing worse, the behavior of some of the fans. With the team now 0-3, some are calling for the coach's head. And it didn't escape the attention of the Monday night football crew. What kind of a week do you think it is on the talk shows in Denver? <laughs> I would assume if Wade Phillips could jam the signals in Denver, he would. <laughs> One of the few places the Broncos could find a friend today was on the Montbello High School football field. And you come up. Former Bronco Louie Wright thinks the Broncos' problem is simple. They don't have the spark. That's the one ingredient that I don't really see, that enthusiasm, that all-for-one attitude. So, to me, I, I see that as a problem more than anything. I've been a long-time fan, but, you know, it's kind of testing my patience here. At Jackson's Hole tonight, the fans watching the Denver huddle were, for the most part, disgusted. I think you ought to get Jimmy Johnson out of retirement. Or Mike Dickon, one of the two. Bronco fans could be forgiven for a little Monday morning, or in this case, Monday evening quarterbacking. After all, the team hasn't had this bad of a start to a season in over 25 years. It's just some uh, mix is not working right there, and they got to find the key, I believe. Number six. You mean we're not supposed to use the plays from 1965, only the uniforms? Oh. In Denver, Tom Costello, my news. In 1968, when the Broncos started the season 0-3, they finished up 5-9. Lou Saban was the coach. Something to look forward to. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up, she's suing because of a heater that got too hot. It's here. <laughs> Denver's number two paper may not like that the Rocky Mountain News has the best sports coverage, an updated, more colorful spotlight section, Denver's best classifieds, and the most comprehensive local and business news available. That's how it's supposed to be done. Now get out! <laughs> but then again, maybe they might. The Rocky Mountain News, the right size, the right time, at the right price. Buy Sunday and get the other six days free. Call 892-NEWS for details. Y'all ready for this? Hey, Denver, get in the game. Get in the game. Ooh, yeah, get in the game. Nugget season tickets are on sale now, and they're going fast. Don't miss your chance to get in the game. Call 893-6700 today. The principal at a middle school in Denver is suing Volkswagen because of severe burns on her foot and ankle. A warning, some of our tape may be hard to look at. Linda Bryson says her foot was burned when the heater core burst in her daughter's 87 VW Jetta three years ago. She says hot water spilled from under the dashboard. Her foot still wasn't healed a month after it happened. Bryson is suing. She says she's in constant pain. Her foot is disfigured. She has to wear special hose and shoes and take physical therapy almost daily. I would not wish this on my worst enemy. It is the worst pain that anyone can describe. There's no description in the English language or any language to describe the pain that a very big victim goes through. 
An attorney for Volkswagen says the car overheated and the heater core ruptured because it wasn't properly maintained. But Consumer Reports magazine says there were problems with VW heater cores in models from 1985 to 1990. A recall was issued in 1992. It was a packed house at the Parker Town Council meeting tonight. Residents there were opposing a crematory in their neighborhood. They're afraid it would decrease the value of their homes and pollute the air. The Parker Funeral Home sits within 100 feet of a residential neighborhood. Director Bob Norton says the demand for cremation has increased and he needs to add the crematory to keep his business. It would mean putting a three to four foot smokestack on top of the roof. Neighbors don't want it there. I don't like the idea of burning bodies in a crematorium unit right behind my house. Norton says neighbors' fears are not justified. It burns everything completely. There is no ash, there's no odor, there's no uh, uh, pollution. One of the opponents called us and said there was no decision at the meeting tonight. They plan to meet again next month. A 410-pound killer who says he's too fat to hang humanely got a reprieve, but it had nothing to do with his weight. Today, a judge threw out his death sentence on a technicality and ordered a new sentencing hearing. 41-year-old Mitchell Roop was sentenced to death for two murders in Olympia, Washington. He claimed he would be decapitated if hanged. If he gets another death sentence, he could be put to death by injection. Investigators finished one job at the site of a deadly plane crash, and a change in the weather might be to blame in the crash of another plane. At the stopping the wreckage from the crash of U.S. Air Flight 427 near Pittsburgh, and now a work crew is decontaminating the site with lime and grass seed. It has been declared a hazardous area because of spilled blood, jet fuel, and asbestos from the plane. Could another U.S. Air crash in July been weather-related? It went down while trying to land in Charlotte, North Carolina. Today at a hearing, an air controller said the weather deteriorated dramatically in the in that area minutes before the crash. 37 people died. No cause of that one has been announced. Mayor Wellington Webb is refusing to pay more money to BAE. That's the company that installed the automated baggage system at DIA. BAE wants an additional $34 million from the city. The company claims the added costs come from the changes the city made to the original baggage system. Webb says Denver won't be held hostage by such unreasonable demands. The claim is one of several to be discussed in mediation hearings that start Wednesday. For years, we've been hearing how the baggage system at DIA was modeled after the system at Frankfurt Airport. Tonight on 9 News at 6, we got a look at how that system works. Frankfurt has had an automated system for 20 years. Today, it's the biggest, fastest, and most reliable automated system in the world. Engineers in Frankfurt came up with the idea and built an automated baggage system in the late 60s. But like DIA, when the airport opened in 1972, the automated system wasn't ready. Our system exists of 12,000 motors, so if, for example, a motor had to be changed because it was too low in power, we had to change 12,000 motors. It took two years to get all the bugs worked out of the Frankfurt system. Tomorrow on 9 News at 6, Tom Costello will tell us how they got it working and what Frankfurt engineers think about DIA. We got a full preview today, and Mike Nelson is next to tell us what tomorrow will be like. news and Denver water. Xeriscaping is a popular approach to green landscaping in dry climates because you can save thousands of gallons of water. The key is to use plants and shrubs suited to our climate. This yard, for example, uses little water, but it does provide a beautiful alternative to traditional landscape. To learn more about the benefits of xeriscaping, call Denver water at this number. It's not just water, it's a way of life. Get water wise with Nine News and Denver water. I did get a chance to go outside and peek at the moon. It was beautiful. Very nice. And if you didn't get a chance yet, we have it on tape for you. So we took care of it. Full service here. You can still run outside and, and do it. We if have you the want. latest in meteorology and we take a great deal of pride in it. <laughs> it is uh, 11 o'clock. Do you know where your weather is? It's right here. Let's mm -hmm. check out the current conditions on the school net. Always at work 24 hours a day. 46 right now at Vail. 61 still at Haxton. And around the Denver area, the cool spot, Summit View Elementary School down Highlands Ranch at 58 degrees. With the aid of Skyscape, take you on a flight out of Denver, and we'll see what's going on around the rest of the nation. We had some clouds and some scattered thunderstorms pushing off to the east of us over central Nebraska. Warm and dry, though, over the upper Midwest, the Mississippi Valley. Temperatures there in the 70s late this afternoon. Big high-pressure system over Indiana keeping things nice and quiet. Down over the southeast, 
A different story in a stationary front, a pattern that's been kind of hanging in there over Florida. They've had about two and a half inches of rain at Tampa today. Pretty quiet in the tropics, just some scattered activity, but no tropical storms to be seen. To the southwest, moisture coming in off the Pacific Ocean. That is fueling some thunderstorms over Utah right now, moving into the western sections of Colorado. And across the eastern part of the state, skies are just partly cloudy, but the mountains will have a little precipitation overnight tonight. While to the north of us, a rather hefty cool front is taking aim on Colorado. Should arrive here on Wednesday and bring us a real taste of fall. Out here in the backyard, a real nice night with mostly clear conditions at the present time. And here's a nice shot by photographer Dave Delosier of that full harvest moon. Now you might think, why do we have a harvest moon and it's still summertime? Because autumn doesn't begin officially until Friday morning. But the harvest moon is the moon closest to the autumnal equinox, and that's why this one is the harvest moon. High temperature for today, 79, 56 was our low. The normals are 76 and 46. Record 93 and the record low at 20. Currently under mostly moony skies at 65 degrees, 46% humidity, barometer 30, 30 and holding steady. And the winds are out of the southwest at 10 miles per hour. Now we do have some changes coming up in the weather over the next 24 to 36 hours brought to us by this cool front that's going to be pushing on through here. For tomorrow, we'll be in advance of it, but some of that moisture coming in from the southwest will still mean a lot of clouds with scattered showers and a few thunderstorms. The temperatures are going to be still fairly mild over the central plains, 80s and 90s. Some cool readings in our mountains only in the 50s, and the snow level should drop down to around 11,000 feet, so there will be some snow mixed in with the showers tomorrow. And then cooler weather still coming in behind that next front. By Wednesday, the front begins to push on through the state. Look for a good chance of showers and maybe a few rumbles of thunder. And then very cool fall-like weather coming in for Thursday as the cool air really arrives from Canada. So temperatures taking a bit of a turn down. Scattered showers and a few storms tomorrow. And then again on Wednesday, under partly to mostly cloudy skies. And here are the highs for tomorrow as you see them. Here's the outlook for tonight. Our skies will be partly cloudy. A chance of a few showers, mainly in the mountains and foothills just west of Denver. Overnight low temperature at 50. Tomorrow's outlook increasing clouds and cool with a chance of afternoon showers. The high at 73. Clouds, cool conditions and showers for Wednesday. A high around 70. Thursday only in the lower 60s with some morning showers. By Friday clearing in 70 and bouncing back to 75 for Saturday. But it looks like we'll finish out summer on a rather cool fall-like note. Ed Nadell? That's only fitting. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Mike. Coming up, his life just got a lot better because of six lucky numbers. This is the Banana, the most comfortable workstation in the world. The Banana is designed so that every part of it adjusts to you. You don't have to adjust to it. Call 1-800-4-BANANA. That's one 800 for banana. Call now. Retirement just got a lot better for a man from Florissant. He's Colorado's newest lotto winner. Gunther Proprotny and his wife picked up their check in Pueblo today. They chose to take lump sum cash. So their take from the $8 million jackpot is $3.2 million before taxes, $2.176 after. Proprotny says he was using a computer to choose his numbers. That wasn't working, so he changed his method. You can take your astrology and uh, all these lucky numbers and all that and bury it because this is not true. You just make up numbers and uh, if you're lucky, you win. If you're not, you won't. Well, he was lucky. <laughs> the Proprotneys will spend part of their winnings on trips to Australia and Alaska. An unusual way to get kids motivated to read. The principal of the elementary school in Basalt is going to make a 6,000-foot skydiving jump. It's called the Dive Into Reading Program. Her husband and two other men thrilled kids by demonstrating the stunt. Judy Jordahl will take her turn in six months. I've done skydiving before, but never into a place this small. You guys are going to have to read a lot of books. Second, third, and fourth graders will have to read a certain number of books each month or a certain number of minutes each night. Then their principal will take the plunge. We'll help. We'll read a couple, <laughs> won't we? Sure, I'm still working on if you're lucky, you win. If you're not, you won't. <laughs> that says a, it all, doesn't it? Yes, it is. It, it takes a lot of analysis. <laughs> Ron Zapolo is here. Wade Phillips gets a vote of confidence from a big guy. An, an important vote of confidence, I think, from the quarterback. Back with that story in all the sports next. 
the vote of confidence from the owner is the kiss of death. Mm -hmm. But what about from the quarterback? Well, I've always said that it was the dreaded vote of confidence, and you knew it was bad. But in this particular case, with John Elway saying this, I mean, I think this is a, a legitimate uh -huh. vote of confidence. So it's, it's a plus, then. A plus. For, for Wade. I, I, I think when Wade comes back to town, he'll, he'll view it as just that. Now, at the top of the broadcast, we heard from John Elway about all the Bronco problems. On the huddle tonight, I asked Elway what he would say to those who think it is time for the head coach, Wade Phillips, to go. Hey, what? I'm 100% behind Wade Phillips. I still believe in Wade Phillips. And I know, um, you know, we're going to get out of this hole. And I think that for everybody to point the finger at Wade Phillips is dead wrong. I said he gets paid to do his job, but we also get paid to do ours. And when you watch that film, it, it isn't Wade Phillips' fault that we're not doing our job and we're not playing hard. And at some point in time, you've got to be a little self-accountable of what, how you play as an individual to help us win a football game. So, you know, I, we're all in Wade's corner, and we all know we're going to battle out of this. And, and I think that, if, if anything, uh, guys are going to respond because of the, the heat they see that, that Wade's taking and come to his defense. John Elway. Now, Wade Phillips was in Texas today attending the funeral of his father-in-law. Jim Fossil, the assistant head coach, filled in for him, met the media, and gave them his view of what's wrong. You know, we can get paralysis by analysis. I mean, let's quit trying to figure out the psyche of everybody and everything, and let's just line up and play tough, hard-nosed football. We're paid professionals that are supposed to get in there, get our job done. I'm not getting my job done. The players aren't getting their job done, and that's the end of the conversation. Monday Night Football, down in Dallas, the Lions upset the Super Bowl champions, the Cowboys, in overtime tonight, 20-17. to 17. The Cowboys have scored first, had the lead, and held it as Barry Switzer looked on, but the Lions up the lead right here when Mitchell hit Herman Moore to make it 17-7 third quarter. But the Cowboys fight back. They get a field goal and then a six-yard touchdown run with four minutes to go by Emmett Smith to tie it at 17. Into overtime, less than two minutes to go in overtime as Jerry Jones claps his approval. Pat Swilling from the blind swat side gets Troy Aikman. Roderick Thomas recovers. And with 27 seconds left, Jason Hansen kicks the Lions the victory. The Cowboys' first loss since last Thanksgiving, Barry Sanders rushed for 194 yards. Emmett Smith, 143. Well, college ball, if you watch the Buffs on Saturday night, you won't be surprised to learn that quarterback Cordell Stewart named today the Big 8 Offensive Player of the Week. The Buffs Saturday take on fourth-ranked Michigan. Now, today, Bill McCartney talked about how he'll prepare his team to play in front of 105,000 at Ann Arbor. None of those people figure to play in the game. And... You know, they're not going to make any plays. So uh, it's just going to be a little louder, and it would be a little more of an aura and a mystique to it. But I've been in that stadium many times, and it's just like any other stadium in the sense that uh, uh, they don't have any more to do with the outcome of the game than you let them have. Bill McCartney, CSU off their biggest win in years at BYU, ranked 25th. In the latest CNN USA Today poll, and Sonny Lubick said today he's really not concerned about where the Rams are in the polls. We're just happy to be there, and that's, that's the way I look at it. Uh, I'm not going to allow it to put any pressure on me because, uh, in a sense, nobody thought a month ago or two months ago that we were ever going to be there. Now that we're there, we just go about our business, don't take ourselves too seriously, and just keep playing football. Sonny Lubick, finally this comment. Like John Elway said tonight, there are numerous problems with the Broncos. Time will not allow us to delve into all of them, but I'll take the most important one, the defense. What follows? A few suggestions. Number one, maybe it's time to go back to the 3-4 alignment. Do that so that Simon Fletcher can once again line up as a linebacker and get away as a defensive end. You won't know when he's rushing and when he's not. He's a better pass rusher as a linebacker. Number two, give cornerback Randy Hilliard a shot. He's aggressive. He seems to be a good cover guy. Number three, I've seen enough of Rondell Jones and Darrell Hall. Give Dennis Smith a call. Appeal to his sense of loyalty, and while you're at it, give him some more money. After all of that, blitz more. I know they're blitzing some now, but not enough. Come from different angles, different places. If you don't improve the pass rush, you're going to see a lot more of what happened the last three weeks. I think that's the number one problem. They cannot rush the quarterback. And tackle some, too. And tackle some, too. <laughs> and everything else. Too. Thanks. We'll be right back.
O.J. Simpson's lawyer, Robert Shapiro, got in a little trouble in court today. Just as the prosecutor was trying to make a point, his cell phone rang. That's Is twice. that counsel's phone? That's twice, Mr. Shapiro. Next, next time, it's mine. I think it was Domino's calling to see if he <laughs> wanted extra was. cheese. <laughs> it was a big weekend in Shelley, Idaho, Shelley's main source of income, guess it or not, Idaho Potato. This weekend was the 66th Annual Potato Harvest Festival in Shelley. There were potato gathering contests to see who could stuff a potato bag the fastest. But the highlight was this, the Spud Tug competition. The losers end up in a lake of mashed potatoes. Ooh. Yeah. On Nightline tonight, Jimmy Carter, Sam Nunn, and Colin Powell, the three negotiators who went to Haiti. They tell us how they did it at 12.20. We'll update at 5.30 on 9 News Daybreak and again at 6 tomorrow morning. Thanks for watching. Good night. This has been 9 News from Colorado's 24-hour news source. Every 9 newscast is closed captioned for the hearing impaired and deaf communities made possible by Grand Pontiac Buick GMC. It's getting late. Do you know where your children are? Put children first. Last summer.